forward. Sport and business have much in common. Competitiveness, dynamism, uncertainty, strategy and execution, and above all, leadership and teamwork. As businesses and corporations take on newer and greater global challenges, they will have to rapidly and efficiently disseminate best practices to their people in a decentralized yet effective manner. Building capacity and speedily bridging competence gaps will have to be done in unique and innovative ways. Anita and Harsha Bogle attempt such an innovation in a most outstanding way by drawing out business lessons from sport in a gripping book. I have loved sport since childhood, especially cricket. This book took me down memory lane. It brought back all my memories of sport and business alive. With the advent of the Indian Premier League, IPL, my wife Neeta and I have become more closely associated with cricket. We have ourselves learned a great deal in business from this association. Harsha has been an integral part of Indian cricket's growth. He is part of an ecosystem which has put India on the global map. Indian cricket is now globally respected and admired. Thanks to the important role that Harsha has played in the process. Harsha has made us romance and understand cricket. His insightful mind has never ceased to amaze me. His immaculate analysis of the game brings new perspectives to one's mind. His personal relationships with great sportsmen have given him unique insights into the game and the minds of its masters. His ability to do parallel processing of information and convert it into golden nuggets garnished by eloquent language is truly astonishing. His partnership with Anita is a great example of how two people can work together. Her sharp, incisive mind, honed by many years in the advertising world, is at the heart of the work they do, and you can see her touch all along. She is the genuine, modern, all-rounder, and as they advocate in the book, they set up a goal for each other to score. This book, The Winning Way, is a great collation of Anita and Harsha's knowledge of sport. They have gathered little pearls of wisdom at the intersection of sport, business, cinema, and life which can be found on almost every page of this book. Reading this book is as pleasurable an experience as listening to a commentary. Indeed, more so. The language has a beautiful flow and the writing is replete with appropriate examples and anecdotes. Their trademark touch is remarkably refreshing. The Winning Way is an invigorating read. Understanding the business world through the lens of sport is stimulating and energizing. The book has expressively and compellingly laid out the ground rules of winning. This book is a great gift to ambitious aspirants from the corporate as well as the entrepreneurship worlds. I do hope the values and lessons derived get well entrenched in the global leaders of the future. March 2011, Mumbai, Mukesh D. Ambani. Chapter 1 Why This Book? Abhinav Bindra, India's only Olympic gold medalist, says, I believe. In an athlete's life, winning is important, but the journey is more meaningful. The constant pursuit towards overcoming one's own limitations and always challenging the part of you that says you will not or cannot win. I am convinced that everybody has at some time in their life faced an equivalent. 
something that feels insurmountable. My perhaps unsolicited advice is enjoy the ride. Let's face it, roller coasters are far more thrilling than merry-go-rounds. Eight years ago, we started a motivational series called The Winning Way. It's a workshop that draws learnings from sport and applies them to organizations. It talks about what champions, sports people and winning teams do in all kinds of sport. The practices they follow, the habits they cultivate. And it tries to draw parallels with corporate issues and situations. The winning way stems from our deep-rooted belief that the formula for winning remains the same. Whether you're a sportsman, a musician, a financial planner, a pharmaceutical salesman or a housewife. Since the principles behind success remain the same, anyone using them should be able to reach their full potential and succeed. Since the winning way has received several repeat requests from Microsoft, HSBC, Unilever, GlaxoSmithKline, Aventis, Cadbury, Marico, Castrol, Colgate and the like, we felt encouraged enough to put together this book. It consists of our reflections on winning, what constitutes a winner and how all of us can, to put it simply, win. The past few years have been a continuous learning process for us. We have witnessed up close the rise and fall of several cricket captains, the emergence of T20 as an interesting innovation in the sport, the metamorphosis of Indian cricket under Ganguly and Dhoni and the domination of Australia in all forms of the game. We have seen many sports persons up close through their ups and downs. While doing all this, through our workshops, we also interacted with stalwarts from industry, many of them passionate followers of sports themselves. And this interaction enriched the dialogue. This book then, while making no claims about being a complete handbook on winning, is the collation of our collective learning from the world of sport and the world of business. In 2004, along with CNBC, we produced a novel program called Master Strokes, where every episode saw a cricketer and a corporate head discuss various aspects of winning. It reinforced our belief that there was much that managers could learn from sport. Over the last eight years, we have travelled across countries and cities speaking about winning and what it takes to win. This book draws from our work, spanning close to 350 sessions for almost 150 companies across all sectors. There were old economy companies trying to cope with market changes and simultaneously with a changed new generation. There were companies that had issues arising from growth and globalization. Some were reeling under the burden of their own growth and some companies were in businesses so new that they didn't know how different their tomorrow would look from today. The one thread that was common to such diversely placed businesses was that they were all keen on winning. We also realized as we went along speaking to these supposedly diverse businesses that whatever your product or service may be, in today's world where technology and processes can be outsourced, plant and machinery imported and finance acquired very easily, it finally boiled down to people. And with these people drawn from the same common pool, it was only team culture and environment, leadership and vision, attitude towards change and occasional failure that determined how well the team performed. The years 2008-9 saw the dark cloud of recession hover over the economy, bringing with it salary cuts, pink slips and tremendous insecurity. This was a huge challenge for everyone, but especially for new entrants to the corporate world who had come in with dreams of a boom time and for HR managers in sectors like IT and BPOs with a very young employee profile. Senior managers told us that they needed to hang on to their jobs since there weren't that many for their kind of profile. As we made this journey, interestingly, we found that winning was not this one-size-fits-all cloak of invincibility. It wasn't a trophy or medal that would look just as good in any display or a rose that would smell just as sweet in any boardroom. Winning came in different shades and sizes. The ambitions of companies and their mission statements vary dramatically. The big realization was that size does matter, but that size isn't everything. That you could have goals and sometimes need to have goals other than being number one. 
Also, that the problems that winners have are often bigger and more complicated than those of the also rans. Over eight years, we have seen the business environment changing, and along with it, we have seen corporate India start to approach success very differently. With many of the companies, we did an exercise where we asked executives to analyze which international cricket team their own team resembled and which one they aspired to be like. In many cases, the first hurdle was for the executives to figure out what exactly was meant by teams, as new age organizational structures, global reporting relationships, etc., have given an all new twist to this term. That sorted out. Many teams aspired to be Australia, the unquestioned leader. But as India started winning, first under Ganguly and then Dhoni, more and more people rooted for India as the team they wanted to emulate. Interestingly, it was also the time when Ellen Mittal and Ratan Tata made it to the covers of international magazines. We often wondered if, in recent years, the state of the Indian economy and the state of Indian cricket seem to be closely correlated. Is it a mere coincidence that Arcelor and Chorus happen around the same time as India's 2020 victory in 2007? Would Ganguly and Dhoni be at ease discussing leadership issues with Nanda Nilekani and Sunil Bharti Mittal? on how to motivate a young india with global dreams and an attitude to match and to think that when we started our careers in 1985 nobody challenged the levers and the tatas quite like indian cricket was happy with respectable draws against england or the west indies those pre-liberalization times were uncomplicated and young executives like us naive and simple dreams were limited and constraints were more talked about than ambition life was simple media options limited and job security was paramount to most people there were a few good brands and a few aspirational employers as young advertising professionals we were account planning media planning servicing people all rolled into one there was no need for specialization when you read retail audit reports and noted small changes in brand share the boss would ask grown by volume or value that was our first lesson that winning on paper was one thing winning in the marketplace through actual volume growth something else today the stakes attached to winning are very high whether in sport or in business people see the growth of cricket in india mostly in financial terms for that has been the most dramatic rise but the world over the game itself has evolved by leaps and bounds The contest between bat and ball is the same but elements like fitness, speed and strategy have become critical and changed the face of the game beyond recognition. New variants of the game like 2020 have emerged. With corporate entry into franchises, the game has become even more exciting and challenging. We are therefore in a strange situation today. On the one hand, it's a perform or perish kind of pressure situation. On the other hand, Leaders are also constantly being told to nurture and empower their teams, understand the whole person rather than merely assess the young man or woman at the workplace. So can the hand that cracks the whip also be the reassuring hand on an overburdened shoulder? Winning today is about finding the balance between being encouraging and being ruthless. Unlike in other areas, winning in sport gives a high not only to those who play but also to people like us who follow it it's a high that is cherished and talked about long after the event there are few things in life more inspiring and motivating than sport this book attempts to share some insights on winning through examples from the fascinating world of real life champions chapter 2 the business of winning emil zatopek the champion long distance runner said An athlete cannot run with money in his pockets. He must run with hope in his heart and dreams in his head. Television, sport's greatest ally, creates dramatic images of adrenaline-fueled athletes making a courageous, even frantic rush towards victory. There are few sights more moving than victory or brave defeat or indeed heroic effort. Remember Sachin Tendulkar braving the sandstorm and the opposition at Sharjah in 
or Anil Kumble bowling with a broken jaw in Antigua in 2002, or Miss Baul Haq down on the ground after having tried so hard in the first World 2020 Championship in 2007. But winning and losing are no more than the last step in a much longer journey, a crucial step, but just one step. Teams that journey better take that last step better, far more easily. Teams that flounder and lose their way in between may reach the end, but in all likelihood, with someone ahead of them. So why do some teams win more often than others? Why are some teams more mercurial, capable of astonishing performances one day and appalling ones the next? Is there a formula to winning that only some possess? Or is it out there for everybody to follow, but only some are inclined to reach out for it? Is there a culture to winning then? And if there is, why do some teams embrace it with a passion, while others merely look at it from a distance? There is what we believe a winning cycle. Winning teams attract the best talent and so possess more resources. Because of the culture, the talent and resources grow faster. and so they win more and because they win more they have a winning team we call it the winning cycle or the business of winning the ideal situation for teams then would be to search for that often elusive cycle of winning the good news is that it exists maybe more like boyle's law with conditions attached than like the basic laws of mathematics that are rigid and therefore more universal and many teams around the world seem able to create such a cycle and keep it going good players like playing in winning teams and as teams create an aura around themselves youngsters dream of being part of the legacy inevitably therefore winning teams attract the best talent and because they create a climate where talent is allowed to flourish players get better faster and that contributes to winning more often Manchester United, Real Madrid and the Los Angeles Lakers for example seem to have created that cycle. Australia's cricket team seemed able to do it. And when we were passing out of IIM Ahmedabad in the mid 80s, Hindustan Lever had a similar aura. The best graduates went there. They learned faster and it became a breeding ground for new corporate leaders. As a result, a day into the placement season, we looked at the guys who had made it there with a mixture of awe and confusion. They were one of us, but suddenly seemed a couple of inches taller. When asked what creates this aura, Nitin Parans, by MD and CEO Hindustan Unilever, elaborated: First and foremost is the capacity to demonstrate that you can win consistently. But that is not enough. You could win and still not have that aura, and that is because of how you go about it. One aspect of that is the means you use to win, the values you demonstrate. The second aspect is how you are seen by others whether you're a thought leader whether you have a clear point of view about the future well before the others the success that you thus achieve feeds on itself but winning today is not enough you need to win today and tomorrow in corporate india where movement is much freer than it is in predominantly inter country sport companies seek to be employers of choice almost as much as they seek market share they know that if you create the right environment talent will flourish organizations rarely have to tell talented driven players to perform more often they just need to make them feel good sort of ganguly would never have had to go to sachin tendulkar and say sachin please we need a 50 from you the team really needs it Tendulkar probably wants to score that 50 or 100 more than anyone else but if the atmosphere in the dressing room is not conducive his mind is likely to be full of negative thoughts as indeed it can be in organizations that employ ambitious men and women when companies start becoming completely goal centric and forget that it is people who produce results they struggle just as players in good teams enjoy going to compete so should people going to work only one reason why the human resource function is such an important aspect of winning teams human resource management becomes even more important during tough times prompting nr narayan murthy to remark at infosys we say at 9am when every one of our people is working 
the market cap may be whatever it is 15 or 16 in these tough days but at 6:15 or 7 pm or maybe 9 pm when the last of us has gone home the market cap is zero in his wonderful book the winner within the former coach of the los angeles lakers pat riley writes of the great bonding in the team that helped in winning the nba title in 1980 but towards the end of the season a young man called magic johnson soon to take the world by storm came off the substitute bench and played a leadership role at the start of the next season the team got drawn into the rivalry partially media created between johnson and the erstwhile star kareem abdul jabbar a battle of one upmanship can be good in a team up to a stage since the points a player scores contribute to the team's score anyway but beyond a point the objective can be to outdo one another rather than do what is best for the team and that can be disastrous for morale and results the lakers now a team in disarray made one of the fastest exits a defending champion has made going out of the first round of the playoffs in 1981 two match winners had collided and taken the team down with them when a harmonious environment might have had the two champions standing shoulder to shoulder what causes winning cycles to break often discord can be produced by players who put individual goals ahead of the team interest they are not too difficult to spot the forward who looks for the dramatic goal from an impossible angle rather than slide it to an unmarked teammate the batsman who slows down in quest of 100 in a one day international and ends up costing his team an extra 20 runs the publicity seeking boss who claims credit for a great product launch it is vital that players medical reps real estate sales executives anyone really have personal goals otherwise we would be robots without them there are times however when teams get into trouble when a collection of such strictly individual goals derails the team ethic so as you can see winning cycles can break if there is discord or if young blood instead of competing stays on the bench for too long if there is no room for fresh talent teams can stagnate in performance and in thought players need to be challenged all the time it is what keeps them hungry and excited and like nature organizations must have mechanisms not only for nurturing but also culling australia remained strong because they had a very rigorous almost brutal exit policy when ian healy wanted to finish in front of his home crowd he was told he couldn't because adam gilchrist was ready Steve Waugh wanted to finish his career with a win in India in 2004 but was told he wasn't going to stay that long and at the first sign of decline in Gilchrist the word must have gone out too at Manchester United when Wayne Rooney and Cristiano Ronaldo arrived Ruud van Nistelrooy was bid goodbye and Ryan Giggs was found more often on the bench than in the field when young players realize they're getting an opportunity because of a stringent exit policy They also know they can't linger when their time comes. Too often, teams spend time retaining talent, whereas culling it when the time comes is a ruthless but just as necessary way of keeping a winning cycle going. Instead, when teams dither, hanging on to players because of sentiment or as a reward, they run the risk of getting stuck with a lot of players on the declining side of a product life cycle curve and end up losing a lot of players simultaneously. Also the message going out to younger replacements is that the individual matters more than the team. That is where Australia have been good over the years, nurturing their players and backing them to the hilt while at the same time recognizing the need to create hungry teams. When 2020 cricket first arrived, the players hadn't played it, but coaches hadn't experienced it either. So their traditional role, which was to impart knowledge based on their own experience, was under threat. To give a slightly different example, when hockey went the Astro Turf way, with hard hitting and quick movements, India's coaches were still stuck on grass, trying to play a beautiful dribbling and skills oriented but obsolete game. So as we have seen, teams need to cull with the same intensity with which they need to nurture. The best teams are those that back their players all the way, but when they find that players can no longer contribute for various reasons 
becoming irrelevant is but one of those. They don't waste time in letting them go. Iconic brands, otherwise, might end up becoming dad's brands. And we saw that when India's economy was opened up and became market-driven. Companies that had thrived on licenses and monopolies and didn't really care about the customer virtually perished. For a long time, the Indian two-wheeler market was dominated by the scooter. And when we were young, bikes were for the somewhat reckless, wannabe young men. Scooters had stepneys in case you got a flat, while bikers didn't care too much about these things. But the scooter was a solid middle-class possession and Bajaj was the god who could deliver one to you. Waitlists stretched for 10 years and so Bajaj really didn't need to compete with anybody. Then, Hero Honda started a revolution. Riding a scooter became terribly passé. You didn't get flat tyres anymore and Bajaj was forced to compete. The iconic Rahul Bajaj gave way to a younger generation who manufactured motorcycles which competed admirably with Hero Honda. Bajaj culled in time or else they could have ended up with the equivalent of classy test players in a 2020 team. While Bajaj was able to re-establish the cycle, leading camera companies were unable to prevent the advance of the cell phone that took photographs. A dramatic change in technology broke the winning cycle for them as it did for Australia in the early years of 2020 cricket. Apart from such major changes, there are others that can cause a winning cycle to break. Teams can at times take their foot off the pedal, lose the focus on winning and let falls build up while they're winning until they become critical and almost impossible to conceal. Some people believe that Colgate Palmolive fell into this trap in the late 90s when they let Hindustan Lever outflank them for a while with the launch of the Pepsodent and Close-Up brands which were targeted specifically at youth. As it turned out, it was just the wake-up call Colgate needed to return strongly. Indeed, in the early days of their long association, Colgate Palmolive's brief to their advertising agency, Rediffusion, was Don't change anything. One got the impression that Colgate Palmolive didn't exactly know which part of their winning formula was working and so didn't want to change anything for fear of removing the successful elements. Sometimes, good teams can take winning for granted delude themselves into thinking that they merely need to turn up to win. They let the arrogance remain, but let the work ethic dwindle. There was always a suspicion that this was the case with the team that followed the great West Indies outfits of the late 70s, 80s and early 90s. The arrogance remained, the work ethic vanished. To prevent teams from starting to think that they have arrived, Deep Kalra, Founder and CEO of MakeMyTrip.com suggests that one think of success as a moving target. As he puts it, the trick is to tell yourself every day that all this success business is firstly relative. It helps to look at other companies, in his case, such as Apple, Facebook, Google and Amazon, or the entrepreneurs behind them. And secondly, that success is mercurial. It can go as soon as it comes, especially once you have public market stock. To return to winning, probably the biggest reason some teams win more often than others is that they know how to win. Many years ago, Michel Platini, one of the finest football players in the world, said the team that would win the Soccer World Cup would be the team that knew how to. You might scoff at this simplistic statement. On close examination, you'll probably come around to the conclusion that there is a lot of truth to it. Why some teams can't keep the winning cycle going Teams that don't win very often invariably don't know what to do when placed in a winning position. They freeze, they choke, as do teams that are so obsessed with the idea of winning that they grow tense and often stop thinking when a calm mind would have taken them home. Maybe there's a story then behind South Africa's misadventures in the World Cup. After a dramatic re-entry to international cricket in 1992, they often found themselves in winning positions and threw the win away. Never more obvious than in the dramatic 1999 World Cup semi-final when they had tied the score and needed only a single from four balls. First, Alan Donald charged out for a non-existent single and almost ran himself out. And then Lance Klusner 
who was hitting the ball wherever he wanted to, hit the ball and ran. Donald didn't. The two players froze with victory waiting at their doorstep. The fear of winning can sometimes be greater than the fear of losing. That is why winning a test series against Australia in 2008 was seen by the South Africans as being as important as winning the Rugby World Cup on a dramatic night in 1995. The beast, which was for so long an annoying tenant, was finally off their back. Yet, when it came to Cricket World Cup events, the tenant inevitably reappeared. For a team with an outstanding win percentage in bilateral series, they continued to choke in mega world events. As a consequence, their obsession with getting results at times derailed the performance that could have got them there in the first place. A young player growing up in that otherwise excellent South African side would have inherited the tension associated with winning on a big day. On the other hand, a young man learning his trade in Australia's awesome teams through the mid-90s and the first decade of the new millennium would have seen how senior players were focused on winning. A young man like Michael Clark, sharing the dressing room with the likes of Shane Warne, Glenn McGrath, Ricky Ponting, Matthew Hayden and Adam Gilchrist, would have learned how to win, how to close matches as part of his upbringing in international cricket. An equally talented young man like Mohammad Ashraful of Bangladesh, growing up in a losing environment, could never have learned the discipline of winning. Self-belief is an essential aspect of development and if you're not winning, you'll never acquire it. We are sure our friends at Hindustan Lever, many of whom have gone on to have outstanding careers, will have a similar story of learning to tell. As indeed will companies that failed to close deals, either because they thought they already had them in the bag or because they didn't quite know what to do at that crucial last stage. In 2006, Australia went to Bangladesh at the end of a very long and tiring season. Their players were exhausted. Brett Lee famously said, There was no fuel in the tank, only fumes. They wanted to be home, and it seemed a rare occasion to see an Australian team wanting to put its feet up rather than play cricket. They were not as intense as they normally were and maybe took things for granted. Another vital truth about sport and live television is that if you take things for granted, it can be quite unforgiving. At the end of the first day in that series, Bangladesh were 355 for 5, a situation that was entirely unexpected and one they had scarcely found themselves in before. To our astonishment, the captain, Habibul Bashar, said at the press conference later that evening that if they scored another 100 runs, they would be safe. We were astounded. But you can understand where Bashar was coming from. If all your life you have aspired not to lose, being safe is an accomplishment. The next day, they had Australia down at 145 for 6 and Adam Gilchrist was at the press conference. We're in a bit of a hole. I need to figure out how to win from here, he said. And in that moment, you could see the difference between the two sides. The underdogs, through years of defeat, were unaware that they were in a winning position. Opportunity had knocked on their door. They didn't recognize it. They weren't ready for it. The champions, on the other hand, were always moving ahead. They were focusing on victory. It came as no surprise when Australia won, despite the fact that they had defeat staring them in the face on more than one occasion during the course of the match. Bangladesh were left thinking, where that could have been a turning point in their cricketing history. Which is why it is often said, to be a champion, you need big match temperament. Similar instances have taken place in the past, when the West Indies were virtually invincible through the late 70s and mid 80s, opponents would look at a lineup that read Greenwich, Haynes, Richards, Richardson, Gomes, Lloyd, Dujon, Marshall, Roberts, Holding and Garner. It created a sense of hopelessness in them and opposing teams have often spoken of losing matches before they had started. It's an interesting phenomenon this, creating hopelessness. The strongest weapon a team has on the field is hope. Till such time as hope is alive, they believe they can win. Once hope dies, the end is swift. 
Steve Waugh, who was part of Australian teams that lost to the West Indies, often spoke about the desire to reach a similar level where his team could win matches before they even began. Can organisations like the West Indies cricket team or indeed the great Bombay Ranji Trophy teams kill hope before a contest starts? In her Harry Potter series, J.K. Rowling writes about the prison at Azkaban where soulless creatures called Dementors suck hope and happiness from the prisoners. These aren't torture chambers, no Guantanamo Bay here. They merely suck hope and that is why Azkaban was such a terrifying place. It is an interesting exercise for organisations to carry out. Does your team have hope? Even on an off day or after a poor quarter, does the team believe it can win? If the opposite is true, the leader has a job on hand. Not necessarily to win the game, but to instill belief in his team that could lead to a win. This hopelessness was vividly demonstrated before the semi-final of the Ranji Trophy in April 1991. The evening before the match, in the course of an informal discussion, it was suggested that Hyderabad had a chance against the mighty Bombay, as they were then called. One of the players seemed to disagree. Nonsense, he said. And here we are attempting a translation from the more colourful Hyderabadi dialect. If you get the openers out, Manzrekar walks in. If you get him out, then Dulkar comes in. Then Vengsarkar, then Kamli, then Pandit. How many do you think we can dismiss? Bombay batted the next day and went on to declare at 855 for 6. Scored at just under 5 and over. A match had been lost even before it had begun and the action on the field was merely a self-fulfilling prophecy at work. Indeed, at one stage when the Hyderabad captain pulled up a fielder for letting a boundary go through. He was told, what difference does four runs make when they have made 700? To create the sense of hopelessness in the opposition, the Australians decided they would seek to win not only every test, but also every day and every session. When the opposition analysed a game and broke it down session by session, they had to come to the conclusion that they had won very little, if indeed they had won anything at all. And to drive home the point, the Aussies made a chart with the days on one axis and sessions on the other. It meant you had 15 boxes and you ticked a box if you won, put a cross if you lost and an equal sign if the session was squared. Having done so and discovered that their opponents had very little to show, they actually put the sign outside the dressing room, not inside, so that it could be seen by everyone. While this might have been rubbing it in a bit, the idea behind it was sound. If you want to create an aura, you do not allow the opposition to believe they have a chance. If they win a session, they might start believing they could win a day and thereafter a game. They could enter a contest armed with hope and belief. And so it was paramount that every session was conquered for the opposition to feel totally devoid of hope. Nitin Paranspe offers an interesting parallel from the world of consumer marketing. We have broken down our market into 153 cells, he says, and each cell is looked at independently. We might be winning overall, but if even 25 of those cells are in red, it is not acceptable. And so while achieving the macro target is the desired outcome, the management of the business has to be more granular. In effect, HUL aim to win every session, every day, not just every match. The hopelessness that such domination can generate can be seen through statements the opposition makes. After another one-sided Ranji Trophy final, the captain of the losing side said, It was a privilege for us to play against Sachin Tendulkar, much in the manner of India's bowlers who were in love with the idea of merely bowling to Don Bradman on their first tour there in 1948. If you were excited, just by being on the same stage, chances are you are unlikely to outperform the opposition. Teams like these that can dominate are often excellent at converting their plans into action. And inevitably, they do the small things better than the opposition can or wants to. 
It is incredible how many matches are won by teams that do the simple things, the one percent things, better. In cricket, that means working hard on fitness, running well between wickets, converting the opposition's three runs into two, and your own two runs into three, taking catches, throwing at the stumps directly. Essentially, things that do not require. an extraordinary level of playing skill but which can be learned by consistent practice these are teams that can do the difficult things batting on bad pitches bowling wicked out swingers turning the ball 12 inches on a flat surface very well but assign just as much importance to the 1% things it is these 1% things that produce consistency and you will find that across all areas of industry organizations that are consistently successful have strong systems and a framework to enforce those systems and so in the course of our corporate sessions we often ask people and the larger teams they represent what their 1% things are and how much time they spend practicing working on them doing the 1% things is a sign of humility while on the other hand ignoring them would be a mark of arrogance it is also a great indicator of work ethic the one factor more than any other that contributes to winning consistently the 1% things tend to be stuff that is not particularly sexy says neil booker former ceo of hsbc in india and while it's tough to make an improvement of 25% it's possible to do 25 one percenters In financial services, things like the industrialization of processes, control over data security, the handling of customer complaints and protocols around the development of talent are the 1% components. In banking, it could be risk management, but more generally, these could be small details like sending thank you notes to people who have done a good job, sharing a joke with your staff, or addressing complaints of your smallest clients. and showing them that you care things that not everybody takes the time to do mukul devras md of colgate palmolive india limited thinks the 1% is alignment it's not enough to have strategy execution is more important and in order to execute the most important thing is alignment neeraj garg coo true care business abbot true care pharma echoes mukul's views Sometimes marketing programs are planned and announced in a big way but marketing collaterals don't reach locations on time our different teams plan wonderfully in isolation but the field force that has to execute all this is overloaded because no one has looked at the programs from his point of view you may have thought through the big idea thoroughly but by overlooking the crucial 1% you could prevent the idea from being fully effective newsweek magazine once did a great cover story on tiger woods and how he dominated his sport but the biggest revelation about the article was what other leading sportsmen had to say in that story joe montana a us pro football legend said he gets on a roll and everybody else starts looking at the board to see what tiger is doing they are watching tv too and they should be playing That is what champions do. They force you to divert attention from your game to theirs. You don't look at your strengths, you look at theirs. The looks of a winner. Inevitably then, champions make their intentions known in the manner in which they carry themselves. The key question to ask about a player or indeed a speaker or a sales executive is, does he look like he wants to be there? or does he look like he would rather be elsewhere when you saw viv richards take the field you could almost sense the intensity the swagger as he walked eyes a bit bloodshot a few pearls of sweat he looked more like a heavyweight boxer taking the ring and everything about his body language said right i'm here let's see if you can get me body language is critical in sport as it is in everything that we do because the way we carry ourselves 
tells the person in front of us what we think about ourselves. As you walk into a situation, your self-image walks along with you as well. You can carry a swagger. You can put on an act for a while. But in the end, your inner confidence or lack of it always reveals itself. Dean Jones told us this great story about playing against the West Indies in their glory days. He was a young man and very nervous, but was trying to mask it by putting on a brave front. While he was batting, Desmond Haynes at short leg kept laughing. What are you laughing about? Jones asked. You are scared, aren't you? Haynes said. Jones thought he would be a bit smart and said, yeah, but don't tell Joel Garner. To which Haynes responded with more laughter. What now? Jones asked. Haynes paused for a moment and replied, he already knows and broke into more peals of laughter. Jeffrey Boycott, for example, liked to walk out to bat as soon as the opposition had walked out to convey to them that he was ready for them, that he was waiting to take them on. Sunil Gavaskar used to get very upset if the two openers didn't walk out together because he thought they were conveying a message to the opposition. And famously in a test in the West Indies, when he was hit on the side of his head, he did not even touch the spot. He didn't want the bowler to know that he was hurt. Mohinder Amarnath, who was batting at the other end, said he feared for Gavaskar when he heard the sound of the ball hitting him, but was amazed when Gavaskar simply stretched himself and got ready for the next delivery. At the end of the over, when the substitute Kiran More charged out with a glass of water, asking if he needed help, he got a earful from Gavaskar. He didn't want to give the bowlers an inch didn't want them to know they had scored a point. Even Tendulkar, known for his great equanimity, has been known to make a point through his body language. In my case, there have been occasions when the bowlers have said a lot of things and I have not reacted at all. And sometimes I have started it when I felt that if I do something, the bowler might get disturbed and do something else. You don't always need to say something. It might just be looking a bowler in the eye. Because when you do that, the bowler knows you mean business. Organizations have a certain body language as well. For example, Reliance is big, brash and its scale of operations is mind-boggling. The Tatas are firm, understated and classy. Infosys is seen to be honest and open. It is a good exercise to carry out. Anil Amani's entertainment venture is called Reliance Big. Infosys came clean when one of their senior managers was accused of sexual harassment. Ratan Tata put his cards on the table and bid goodbye to Shingur at some cost to his nano project. You don't expect Mukesh Ambani to think small either and his ambition of building the world's largest refinery has not surprised anyone. Probably body language is best manifest in the area of sales where the retailer knows that the salesperson requires the sale to achieve his targets. And yet, the salesperson needs to appear committed enough to convince the retailer that it is in his interest to place an order. Sometimes, the salesperson, like the leg spinner, needs to sell a couple of extras to the retailer. Or the product manager has to appear more convinced than he really is to the advertising agency. It is a game that is critical for success. It is a game that must be played well, not an act that is lightly worn, for it can expose people. Here are some questions every organization must look at very closely. How do their employees appear to the outside world? What is the message they are subliminally conveying about themselves and their company? The Winner's Mind for all their ruthlessness, sportsmen and indeed all winners need to have the demeanour of a monk. Sport is about calm minds and violent bodies. The reverse rarely works. And yet it is difficult to stay calm amidst the pressure to perform. Abhinav Bindra, India's gold medalist in shooting, 
at the 2008 Beijing Olympics actually practiced it through an unusual combination. Essentially, it was adrenaline training, rope climbing, scaling walls, walking on a tightrope 70 or 80 feet above the ground. The idea is to get a rush, a flow of adrenaline, and then to remain calm in that situation. Buddhist monks frequently talk about living in the present and ridding the mind of baggage of the past and the anxiety of the future. Like individual sportsmen, teams tend to carry their baggage with them as well. Teams that have had glorious pasts, like the Indian Hockey Squad or the Mumbai Ranji Trophy, can sometimes run the risk of living in the past. We recently met the head of a leading advertising agency, who said his company Shoreel still began with advertising created in the early 80s. For years, Mumbai cricketers used to talk of their glorious heritage and how it was easier to play for India than it was to play for Mumbai. Indian coaches, locked in the past, focused on dribbling skills, unaware that hockey had long transformed into a game of speed and power. Sometimes, a great past can make teams oblivious to the present and force them to live in denial. It can frustrate the modern player since he is constantly being compared to legendary figures of the past. A sports person succinctly summed it up for us when he remarked that players seem to get better every day after they retire. Teams need to build on their heritage, not get blinded by it. And maybe the best way to do it is to embrace the present and address present needs. In fact, Viren Raskina, former captain of the Indian hockey team said he couldn't relate to some of his coaches because they talked about players and styles he had never seen. It is critical that the team on the field is given the impression that it is the lineup of the day, that it is the team that is going to deliver and it must be empowered. Glorifying players who have retired or are unavailable demeans those who are actually playing. Some other teams might have had a very ordinary past and can carry wounds of defeat. Since the only thing they are good at is losing, they tend to lapse into a cycle of defeat from time to time. Often they hold back, taking tentative steps when a giant stride might have made the difference. Teams that are locked into the past need fresh leadership and newer players who have not been painted by the brush of defeat. South Africa did that when they picked a brash 22-year-old to be their cricket captain. Graham Smith had played very little international cricket and was clearly ambitious, but his biggest qualification was that he had never played with or under the charismatic and later disgraced Hansi Kronier. South Africa needed to turn over a new leaf, break its links with a past that was overwhelming but negative. Initially, there was a great deal of turmoil and pain, but it turned out to be an excellent decision. Good teams are able to leave this baggage behind when they take the field. But equally, they are able to put aside the anxiety of the future. Mukul Devras shares one of the rules that his company followed during the launch of a new product, which already had a powerful competitor. Be nimble and flexible, he says, to change resources. But never lose hope and more importantly, do not demoralize the team. Don't make the competitor into an invincible demon.